everybody, I'm back with another cheese video. I've never made cheddar before, mainly because of the amount of weight that's required to press it. Uh, me using my, if you watch my other videos, me balancing uh, dumbbells on the top of the mold um, just wasn't working out. And it, you require 50 pounds of pressure, and the most I had was 25. So. I broke down and bought a cheese press. More about that later and I'll show it to you when it comes time to press this. I'm making a batch with four gallons of milk so it should be once again roughly a, a, a four pound cheese. And I'm unfortunately I won't be able to put the uh, link to a recipe down below. This one isn't coming off of the internet. It's in Ricky Carroll's book and on their website at cheesemaking.com they have a farm cheddar recipe, uh, which I'm sure is an excellent cheese. But this, the, in, the, in her book, she has this one called a stirred curd cheddar, which is quicker to make, easier to make than the farm cheddar. So that's the one I'm going to go with for the first time here. So if you want to do this, you've either got to buy the book or take notes, I guess, as I, as I make this. I have the milk, once again, in my double boiler arrangement, trying to increase the temperature to 90 degrees. It's only been there a few minutes, but let's see what it is. It's still down in the low, low 50s, so it hasn't, it's got a long ways to go yet. But what I'm adding at this point is coloring. I've only ever added coloring to one other cheese that I made, and that was um, the Colby. And I think I added what they recommended when I did the Colby. I don't know. There was an aftertaste. I liked the Colby. I ate it all. It was a very good cheese, and it's a, it's a quick cheese to make. It doesn't age all that long. Uh, after having eaten it, I can't I can't describe what I was what I was. I don't think it was part of the cheese. I think it was something to do with the annatto. And here I am adding more, but I'm only adding half what they suggest. Uh, they suggest two drops of annatto for every gallon of milk, and I'm only adding one drop. No matter how much you add, if I added the two drops, you wouldn't see a great deal of difference in the in the color of the of the raw of the milk. It uh, comes out more once it's into curds and been pressed and whatever. So this should produce a paler yellow cheese, I guess. Anato is a, a natural product. It's it's the a coloring taken from a tree, the Anato tree, I suppose. And uh, if you buy any kind of yellow cheese, yellow, um, I suppose even that craft slice stuff or um, yellow cheddar or Colby or whatever. It's got a natto in it, that's what made it yellow. You can get a, a nice yellow uh, cheese by using a high fat contact milk, content milk, uh, something like uh, Jersey cows give, I guess. I've never had a Jersey cow, but they give beautiful heavy green milk. But if, if not, you're going to end up with a, a white cheddar, which isn't anything wrong with that. I, I like white cheddars too, but I'd like it to have a little coloring, so the annatto is in there. I'll bring you back when uh, I get this up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Still waiting for it to get up to temperature, but I'm now adding a teaspoon of calcium chloride in a quarter cup of water. Tap water for me because it's direct from a well and doesn't have any chlorine or whatever in it. If you have city water with that's chlorinated, you have to use I don't know, even a, a bottled water. As long as it doesn't have chlorine. You add the uh, calcium chloride to milk that's been pasteurized mostly, and this is store-bought pasteurized milk. It increases the acidity, which gives you a stronger curd. We will come back when this thing gets to 90 degrees. Well, it's reached the target temperature, 90 degrees, 90.3 degrees Fahrenheit, close enough, I guess. And now you add the culture, and it is direct set mesophilic culture, 
what the New England Cheese Company calls C101, I guess. It's I'm doing four gallons of milk. The recipe is for two gallons, so I'm doubling everything. I'm putting two of these sachets of the direct set mesophilic. Now let that hydrate on the surface for a minute or two. And I'll thoroughly mix it in and cover the container and it ripens for 45 minutes. So I'll bring you back in 45 minutes time. Well it has ripened for 45 minutes and I checked the temperature it was down a couple of degrees so I put it back in the hot water bath and brought it back up to 90 degrees. Now I've added a teaspoon of rennet, animal rennet I'm using, diluted in a quarter of a cup of water. Stir it in for a minute or so here. Then it gets covered and it sets for another 45 minutes. All the rennet does its work and for, forms a curd. So I'll bring you back when it's time to cut the curd. It is set for its 45 minutes. I have a nice firm curd. Instructions are to cut it into a quarter inch pattern, which I think is probably the smallest I've ever done. So I will go this way, quarter inch, and I'll turn and go across this way. And I will bring you back when I've done that and show you what I do with a wire whisk to finish cutting the curd down in the sides of the bottom of the pot to get it down to somewhere around a quarter of an inch curds. I think some of my quarter inch squares are larger than others. But what I do now to continue cutting it if you've watched my other videos, I've been doing this for a while. I use a wire whisk and just slowly keep going around in circles and lowering it a little bit every time I complete one circuit of the pot until I've got all the way to the bottom and that cuts the curds quite nicely into smaller pieces anyway. The other way to do it is to slant the uh, curd cutting knife. And I don't seem to have much luck when I do that. I end up with a lot of very large pieces. So I'll bring you back once I have finished this part. And actually I probably wait until it settles. Uh, once you have cut the curds you then let it settle for 15 minutes before you move on to the next phase. So I'll bring you back after it's had its 15 minutes of settling. It has settled now for 15 minutes. Most of the curd is down below the way. Checking the temperature here it's dropped about 85. Over the next 30 minutes you slowly increase the temperature to 100 degrees and it says not more than 2 degrees every 5 minutes. Well, Try my best there, I guess. But stirring gently as you do it. I've got it back in the hot water bath. But the water temperature is... What did I say it was here? The water temperature is 90... About 95 right now. 96, I guess. I haven't got the gas turned on right now. I'll just keep monitoring the temperature and increase the temperature of the water in the hot water bath a bit every once in a while. And hopefully in 30 minutes time I'll have it up to 100 degrees. I'll bring you back at that time. Well, I've been a little bit over the 30 minutes but not much and I've got it up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Now the next part is stirring it again for the next 30 minutes and maintaining the 100 degree temperature. After that you let it settle for 5 minutes and then it gets put through a colander to remove the whey. So I'll bring you back when it's time to put it through the colander. Well, I maintained the temperature at 100 degrees and continued stirring for 30 minutes. And now it has been resting for 5 minutes. And you remove the whey. It didn't say to line the colander with cheesecloth, but I'm lining the colander with cheesecloth. Of course, I got a phone call. <laughs> Just when you were had a lot to do, you got a phone call. But anyway, that is all of the curd, and it said not to drain it too long, because you don't want it to form into one solid mass. So it's been draining there now for two or three minutes. I'm going to put it back in the stainless steel pot, and I'll show you the next part of this. Well, it's back in the stainless steel pot, and the pot is back in the hot water at 100 degrees. And now you get to actually play with it with your hands, gently sort of breaking up any of the larger pieces that are in there. It no longer settles down as by the pot is moving. It's the, with the way gone, the pot is floating on the hot water. But for the next hour, you keep it at 100 degrees. And right now I have to add the salt. It has four tablespoons for four gallons of milk, a tablespoon per gallon of uh, cheese salt. And that's what I'm using is something I buy that's called cheese salt. But all that means is it's a non-iodized salt. And the cheese salt is milled into a very fine grain so that it will dissolve quicker than any larger grain salt. So any fine grain salt, I guess, that isn't iodized and you'd be all right with it. I buy this from the cheese making supply company and they call it cheese salt. Now with your hands, you mix this in. And it says not to squeeze the curds, just to break them up, but don't, don't compress them. So that's what I'm trying to do here, I guess. Don't want any large mats of curd in there. Okay, now it gets covered and uh, every five minutes you take the cover off and stir it, but you have to maintain the water temperature at 100 degrees and that's for an hour. So I have this cute little gizmo around my neck here, meant to be for baking I guess, but that will remind me when the five minutes is up and I've got to set the timer on the stove for an hour. So I'll see you back here in an hour's time. What I forgot to mention, I guess, is that this process of stirring the curds every five minutes is the cheddaring process. Uh, and the stirred curd method, uh, you're doing it this way with the, the um, well, traditional, I guess you would call it, cheddar cheese method. It would be in slabs of uh, curd and you would be heating them up the same as this, keeping them 100 degrees for an hour, but then they have to be broken up into smaller pieces before you go on. I don't know what else you do. I haven't really read the instructions in great detail, but this method is, that I'm using is supposed to be faster and uh, less work involved and hopefully still turns out a decent cheese. I have already stirred three times, I guess, but I'll bring you back when this part of the process is over with. Well, that hour went by relatively fast, and uh, it was quite easy to keep the temperature at 100 degrees. Only had to raise it a few times. It's now going into this mold. I know I'm blocking the way, but there's no way of me doing this without getting in the camera way here, I guess. And I want to make sure that I get it all in the, in the mold. I was concerned about the annatto, as I said earlier, whether or not it would impart a flavor. Well, I've tried these curds now two or three times, and I love the taste of them. Of course, it isn't concentrated yet. When you uh, concentrate it down by pressing out more of the whey, 
It's hard to say what it will taste like. Right now it tastes very good. And now you're going to get to see my new cheese press. I can get this in there. I'll bring you back in just a second when I have the cheese press set up. The first pressing is at uh, 15 pounds for 10 minutes. And I'll see if I can get this set up and then I'll come back and talk a bit here. That's about 15 pounds, I think. Now, this cheese press, of course, is using springs rather than weights. So the thing that you have to watch out for is that as the weight, the springs press the, the curds down and it, it expels whey, then the uh, pressure of the spring is less. Like already that's gone to 10 pounds, so I'll try to... Anyway, this is only for, for 10 minutes. I think later on, after you've got the cheese more consolidated, it isn't so much of an issue. Uh, like the final pressing on this is 50 pounds for 24 hours. But what I wanted to talk about here is a bit of controversy about this cheese press uh, on the website where I bought it. Um, I keep interrupting myself. Uh, uh, one of the comments was from somebody I presume in the UK telling the people at cheesemaking.com that they or the cheese making supply company that they should be ashamed of themselves because that is the Wheeler cheese press. Well, in a way I agree. Many years ago, back before the internet, when everything was mail order, I had a small mail order company and I sold uh, items for goat keeping, um, all little various things that you could use, pails and all that sort of thing for goat keeping, as well as cheese making supplies, and I sold the Wheeler Cheese Press, which is from England. Um, and it's identical to this, so I tend to agree with the comment, this is probably the Wheeler Cheese Press, but I'm not accusing the cheese making supply company of, you know, stealing the pattern or anything. I went online and tried to find the Wheeler Cheese Presses in the UK, and the only ones that I can find are ones that uh, people are selling used on eBay or whatever. So I'm, I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking they probably bought the uh, pattern or bought out the Wheeler Cheese Company and now they put their own name on it. But that's just my thoughts on the matter. But anyway, it is definitely identical to the Wheeler Cheese Press. I sold quite a few of them, like way back. I'm talking back in the 70s sometimes. So. I'll bring you back when it is time to take that out of the mold and turn it over, hopefully without it falling apart. It's had its 10 minutes at 15 pounds. Now to see if I can get it out of here and turn it. Hopefully it consolidated enough that I can flip it over. Already I'm thinking that this mold that I'm using is probably too big. Uh, it's about eight, eight inches wide, but it's, I think we're going to end up with something less than two inches thick. So. I may have to invest in another mold to make cheddar. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but somehow I don't think so. I think it's going to be too thin. Did its first flip okay anyway. And I'm using again this uh, new kind of supposedly disposable cheesecloth. Uh, if you watched my last video on making the, the chili pepper gouda, I used the same piece of cheesecloth, plastic cheesecloth, and I have. Uh, 
washed it and then I sanitized it. I'm using it again. It seems to work just as well now as it did the other time, so I don't see where it's disposable. Well, I mean, eventually you'll throw it away, but I convinced it'll work fine for at least two pressings and maybe more. Bring you back as soon as I get this back in the cheese press again. It's back in the press, and this time at 30 pounds pressure for 10 minutes. That was Angel shaking in the background, in case you're wondering. I don't have bells here. And again, I've got to keep an eye on the, on the pressure to make sure that it stays close to 30 pounds pressure for the next 10 minutes. So I'll bring you back at the next 10 minutes over with. Well, it's had its 10 minutes at 30 pounds, and it was much easier uh, to keep it at that pressure this time. It's compressed the cheese enough that I didn't have to adjust it very often. Maybe I'm hopeful that I will like this cheese more. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be taking it down too terribly thin, not yet anyway. They sell a stainless steel mold, and I didn't get it with the with the press. Um, I don't know. It's a mold that doesn't have any bottom. And I know a lot of people use them. I prefer a mold that has a bottom. I don't know why, but I do. And I've used this one to make Gouda cheese. And it came out well, but it was kind of thin. But time will tell how thin this one is, I guess. Well, I get it back on the press, and then I'll bring you back. Okay, it's back on the press at 40 pounds pressure. And it stays at that pressure for two hours. And do you notice anything different? <laughs> I was forgetting to use the drip tray that came with it. Uh, consequently, the whey was running all over the, the wood and just running down into this uh, draining mat that I, I always use for my cheeses so that the whey will drain off into the sink. But as you can see, it's already starting to, to come out here. Uh, and like it is supposed to, it's supposed to drip off the drip tray. Completely forgot about using it. Well, I'll bring you back in two hours' time. At that time, it gets flipped one more time, and it goes under 50 pounds pressure for 24 hours. So I think this is going to hold the 40 pounds pretty much, although it is expelling some whey, so I may have to adjust it a little bit. But it doesn't seem to require adjustment as often now as it did the, the first couple of pressings. Well, I'm really liking the cheese press. I went out for a couple of hours while this was pressing at 40 pounds, and when I came back it was still right on the 40 pounds. So couldn't have pushed out a lot more of the whey, I guess. It's just consolidating the cheese. I am curious as to what it weighs, so I've set my scales up over here. Just about exactly four pounds. Three pounds, 15.7 ounces. So at this point, it weighs just about exactly four pounds. I suppose it will be less when it's at its next long pressing. But I think I'm all right with the, the depth. It's about what I said. It would be about two inches, and that might even be less than two inches. But for the size of the wheel, I think I'm okay with that depth. It's going to have to be, there's not nothing to do about it, I guess. Now this goes back in, and as I said before, under 50 pounds pressure for 24 hours. Serious pressure. I'll show you that when I get it back in the press. Well, there it is set at 50 pounds pressure. I will keep an eye on it over the next few hours to see if I have to tighten the springs down a little bit more. But other than that, I will bring you back in 24 hours time. Well, it finished its 24 hours at 50 pounds of pressure and that did make it expel a little more whey. It now weighs 3 pounds 13 ounces, so it's down almost uh, 3 ounces, 2.7 ounces or something less than it weighed before I put it in there. It's turned a almost a pale butter color, I would call it. So 
and I think the amount of annatto that I used is doing its thing. If I remember rightly, I think it got darker after it had aged it a while with the Colby that I made. Anyway, this now gets left at room temperature for two to seven days until it's dry. I've got it on a large platter, actually, not just a plate, it's on a platter. It has a couple of cheese mats down below it so there'll be some air circulation under it. But I will turn it daily and I will keep it covered with a butter muslin just so dust or flies or whatever couldn't get on it. And once it has completely dried, I will be vacuum sealing it. It says to wax it. I no longer wax, I vacuum seal. So I'll bring you back and show you the vacuum sealing. And then it ages for anywhere from two to six months. So I'll probably age it two or three months anyway before I before I try it, but I'll put this video up as soon as I have it um, vacuum packed. Well, the cheese has been drying for three days, and I think it's dry enough. So I'm going to try vacuum sealing it. Hopefully I don't have the same problems with my vacuum sealer that I had when I was doing the Gouda. For some reason it just wouldn't seal. I got it eventually, but I had to so I ended up making two or three bags before I got it right. I like the color of this so far. It's, like I already said, it's like butter. I make my bags way too big. That might be the problem. I don't know. A bag too small, it doesn't work at all. It says it's sealing it, so let's hope it knows what it's talking about. Yeah, that seems to be okay, I guess. Well, I'll be putting that in the cheese fridge, and it will be turned daily. It ages at the same temperature, around 50 degrees, that my uh, Gouda that's already in there ages at. But I probably won't be uh, opening this until December, so we'll have a tasting in December. Thank you very much for watching.